Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. Good morning, this service. I'm Pastor Jeffrey, one of the pastors here in SIBKL. Uh, and it's so good to see so many of you. Uh, there are a lot of empty seats in between because a lot of our members, they are in Miri for the tribal gathering. Uh, but praise God for all of you. And I'm so happy to see uh, my fellow pastors, uh, lay pastor, Pastor Twain, uh, Pastor John is up there, and my elder, uh, elder SK here. I don't feel so lonely. Uh, yeah. Okay, praise the Lord. So today, I'm going to bring to you uh, this sermon entitled, Honor and Care in God's Family, taken from 1 Timothy chapter 5. So I have four main sections in my sermon. Uh, so the four sections are, as you can see on your screen, honour and care across the generations, honour and care for widows and those in need, uh, honour and care for elders, uh, pastors and leaders, and honour the appointment of elders, pastors and leaders. Yeah, so uh, let's look at the first verse uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Yeah, let's look at the first verse. Is it there? Okay. So the first verse reads, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. So when you read this verse, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? When I read this verse, the first thing that comes to my mind is the word honour. Yeah, the word honour, uh, the Hebrew verb or action for the word honour is the word kabat, which means to be made heavy, to give weight, be honoured, enjoy honour, be made abundant, to get oneself glory or honour or gain glory. So like for example, if Elder SK speaks to me and I honour him, I will give weight to what he says to me. So that is the meaning of kabat here. That is to give weight, uh, to honour somebody, uh, to make abundant and to get oneself glory or, and honour. So you have heard this saying, I'm a man of my word because your word is your honour and that is what honour really means. Yeah. So in SIBKL, uh, the staff, we have a staff culture. So there are five elements of the, our staff culture and one of the culture is the culture of honour. So in SIBKL staff team, uh, we have this culture of honour and this is in our key performance indicator, our KPI. And at the end of the year, we are a praise uh, even in this element of honour. Yeah? So what do we uh, so-called measure ourselves? So we have these two elements. I revere and esteem God highly in everything that I do. So in SIBKL, everything that we do, we revere and esteem God highly. And the next point is, I treat others with dignity and honour because they bear God's image. So my brothers and sisters, all of us bear the image of God. So we are to treat others with dignity and honour because we bear His image. So at the second service, I make mention that we have a lay pastor by the name of Pastor Eddie. And I tell you, he is one guy who really... Uh, give dignity and honour even to those uh, people who are homeless, uh, people who did, do not have uh, people to bury them or give them a decent funeral. So I remember one case where there was a homeless man who passed away and nobody took care of his funeral. And Pastor Eddie, a one-man show, took his guitar, sang a worship song, and send off this homeless man and give him dignity and honour and give him a decent burial. So that is what we are to do as family, 
as brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? So that is honour for you. So in SIBKL, we are more than a two or three generational church. So if you look at this table, uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you are born between 1925 and 1946? Is there anyone here this morning? Wow, praise the Lord for you, brother. Anyone else? I see a sister there. Wow, up in the balcony, anyone? Wow, I see the hand. Wow, praise the Lord. So you are the greatest generation or what we call the silent generation. If you're born between 1925 and 1946, we bless you. You are the great grandfathers of the church. Amen? Yeah, so Pastor Chu is born in 1946. So he's 77 years old this year. Yeah, so, uh, so he belongs to the greatest and the silent generation. How many of you here, you are baby boomers? Yeah, a lot of us are baby boomers. Amen, yeah. So when you look at this table, we are more than a three-generational church. So let me honour uh, those who are in the greatest and the silent generation. Father God, I bless even the grandfathers of the house I pray a lot even for the greatest and the silent generation that you will grant them long life, O oh Lord, that they will see many, many good years ahead of them, O oh Lord. And I pray that they will be like Caleb at the age of 85, saying to uh, Joshua, give me this mountain because there are still giants to be conquered. And may that be you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so we did a recent survey uh, of the cells and this is the result of the survey. So out of uh, the 100 over cells that we have, we have 105 adult cells which represents 74% of the cell population and we have only 33 young adult cells and 5 young family cells. So if you look at these statistics, Three quarter of the church are adults and only one quarter are young adults. So young adults, where are you? Woo! We really need to bring in the young adults, right? Amen. So let us come alongside the young adults. Let's grow the next generation. If not, the church is just one generation away from extinction. We really need to grow the next generation. And we, the older generation, we are to come alongside them and really grow this next generation. So, uh, we thank God even for SIBKL and this is our vision statement. So, won't you come and uh, read it along with me Yeah, at the count of three? This is our vision statement at the count of three. One, two, three. We are inspired by God to influence the nations and impact generations. One more time, very weak. You are weak or not? Yeah? Okay, one more time at the count of three. One, two, three. We are inspired by God to build a strong, excellent and dynamic church to influence the nations and impact generations. We are our SIBKL family. Say to your neighbour, we are SIBKL family. Many of us uh, would know that next year, 2024, we are going through a period of transition. So the next slide, you will see that we are going to transit from founder-led to vision-led. So our church in SIBKL, we are founded in 1994. And the first generation founder is Pastor Chu and Pastor Lee Chu. So from 2024 and beyond, we will transit from founder-led to vision-led. And the next generation of pastors led by Pastor Isaac, woo, he will lead the main church. Amen? So let us, the older generation, don't feel jealous about them. 
No need to be jealous one. Yeah? We've been there, we've done that. Now it's their turn to rise up to lead the church to the next level. So we always say that our ceiling is their floor. So may they bring SIBKL even to the next level. So as you can see from the next slide, this is our SIBKL family. So this picture looks like a wheel uh, with a hub in the middle, which is SIBKL, and we have four spokes. So we have the main services, and the pastor in charge next year will be Pastor Isaac. So the main services include Life Community Chinese Church at SMCC, and of course the BM Church uh, over here in Bangananyin. Then we have three church plants, Life Gen Church, which meets at 4 p.m. at SMCC. We have Water, which is workplace at the river in Wisma Maran. They meet on a Thursday evening in KL. And of course, last but not least, we have Sungai Bulo Church, headed by Pastor Fergus uh, over in Sungai Bulo. So, this is what we have currently uh, a wheel with the spoke SIB with the four spokes and it is our prayer that in the years ahead when the new generation the next generation the generations that are ahead of us they will grow these four spokes to 6 to 8 to 12 amen so let us come alongside them and let's build SIBKL family so how do we honour and care for the generations? Yeah? For older men, treat them as fathers, encourage him. Yeah? So uh, a few weeks ago, I was sharing on honour, even in our staff refresh, and I spoke to the youngest pastor in our group, which is Pastor Sean Quack. He's 26 years old. I am 60, going on to 61 and I told Pastor Sean, I can be your father. In fact, my eldest boy is 32 years old. Yeah? So treat the older man as your fathers. Encourage him. Younger men, treat them as brothers. Yeah? So I love to talk to the younger people. And I always call them, hey bro, hey bro. You know? So treat them as brothers. Love them as your own. Older women, treat them as mothers. Honour and love them. And younger women, treat them as sisters, love and treat them in all purity. Amen? So, again, tell your neighbour, we are SIBKL family. Amen. So, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, this is the key verse in the study in 1 Timothy. It says, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. So this is how we ought to behave in God's family because we are the pillar and the foundation of the truth. We need all generations, not just the young generation or the old generation, but we need all generations in God's family. So the next slide you will see, we need the bravado of the younger generation and we also need the belief of the older generation. So older generation, don't talk down on the younger generation. The worst thing for us older men is to tell a younger man, hey, I eat more salt than you eat rice. Yeah? So they don't like to hear these kind of statements from us. So, so the bravado of the younger generation and we need to believe in them. Amen? So we also need the risk-taking of the younger generation and we also need the resources of the older generation. And thank God for the older generation. You are the generous Lord. You have been tithing and giving your offerings so faithfully to the church. And that's why we need both the risk-taking of the younger generation and the resources of the older generation. 
And please don't complain to us, wow, this LED too bright. Uh. Yeah. Why so loud on the music? You know? So let's come alongside them. Yeah? And we are trying to come in between. If not, our worship songs uh, will all be like, wow, very loud. Yeah? So we are trying to tone even to all generations. Amen? So let's come alongside them. So in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we have the story of these two kings and this is their response to the generation. So Hezekiah, Hezekiah say uh, in 2 Kings 20, 19, I, uh, this is not my problem. Uh, when I grow old, uh, uh, you know, I'll be six feet underground. So let the next generation you know, take care of themselves. This is not my problem. Don't be like Hezekiah. Be like Josiah, which says, this is my burden. 2 Kings 23, 1. So we really need to have a burden for the next generation. Amen? So may we be like Josiah and say, this is my burden. I want to build the next generation. So the next statement from Pastor Chiu, it says, we older generation cannot overcome without you, the younger generation. And you, younger generation, cannot advance without us, the older generation. Let us walk hand in hand, even as we take territories for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So generations are not replacements. Generations are reinforcements. Uh, Pastor Leah from HOGC. So be the bridge across the generations and not be the gap or the wedge that divides it. So we often hear that, oh, there's a generation gap. So in SIBKL, may there not be any generational gaps. Amen? May we be the bridge across the generations. Amen? Yeah, and what is the application for us even for this point? The application for us is to treat all generations with utmost honour, respect and kindness, encourage rather than rebuke harshly, treat all women with utmost purity. Amen? So, as always, every time when I preach, people will ask me, Pastor, are you going to sing? So maybe I'll just sing a bit. Uh, this song, if you know this song by Ray Boltz, uh, please sing along with me. Yeah? It goes something like this. You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us. When we're walking side by side As long as there is love We will stand Yes, as long as there is love We will stand And Jesus gave us a new commandment That how do people know that we are Christians? People will know that we are Christians because they see our love one for another. Amen? Let's pray for the generations. Father God, we thank you even for the generations. And we pray, O Lord, that across the generations, that there will not be a divide. But, O Lord, we pray that we will build bridges across the generations. That even as we look to the next generation, I pray for the older generation that we will come alongside them, that we will be the wind beneath their wings, O Lord, that we will lend them strength and we will run with them. And I pray for the next and the younger generation. I pray that even as they receive the baton from us, that they will run and they will truly exceed and do more exceedingly abundantly, more than we could ever do because they have the tenacity, they have the strength, and they take risks like the younger generation. 
So bless the generations in SIBKL, even as we commit them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's move to the next point, which is honour and care for widows and those in need. So you may be asking me, Pastor, can we skip this part? Uh? Not relevant to me. But let me tell you that this part is very relevant to all of us. And let me ask you this question. How many of us, by the show of hands, you have only one single surviving parent with you? Yeah, there are many hands up there. So this portion of scripture is very relevant to you because your mother or your father who is staying with you, if you only have a single parent staying with you, your mother is a widow, your father is a widower. Yeah? So it is relevant to us. And let's look at scripture in verse 3. Honour widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So let me pause for a while, the next slide, and just focus on this phrase, make some return to their parents. So imagine with me for a while, yeah? So imagine there's a family of four, father, mother, son, daughter, yeah? So the son is the eldest son. So you see this very often in those Chinese melodrama, even Korean dramas, and uh, some even Indian movies are very, uh, very tragic and very dramatic one. And also imagine with me, uh, so a family of four, mother, father, brother, sister. So the father passed away. So the mother has got to raise the son and the daughter. And, and she does that by cleaning dishes, by going to houses to clean the houses from house to house. So she slogged very hard. Uh, and the son wants to be a doctor. And after that, the son graduated as a doctor. And after that, marry, uh, marry a wife. And the mother is still working, washing dishes, you know, caring for the family. And the younger sister, because the mother can only support the son, so the sister didn't go to school. Then you see this drama on a rainy night. The mother came with the daughter to the doorstep of the son, knock, knock, knock. Then the daughter-in-law at the door. Why are you here? Get lost. You know, your son now is a, 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 a renowned doctor. You, know, you are bringing shame to him if you come. You know? So then the mother cough, cough, cough. Then, oh, I've got blood in the handkerchief. You know? Yeah, so how many of you, you have seen such dramas before, right? Very dramatic. But in real life, unfortunately, it does happen as well. So this passage is very relevant to all of us. So uh, I don't know about SIBKL. I believe that you are a fantastic church. You care for your parents. But we have heard so many stories of widowed mothers uh, that their children don't care for them. Yeah? And that's why this passage is so relevant to all of us. And even the Lord Jesus Christ, when He was dying on the cross, remember Jesus is the firstborn of Joseph and Mary. Even when He was dying on the cross, He was making arrangements so that the mother is well taken care of even after he dies. So the next slide you will see uh, and you read from John 19 verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple whom Jesus loved, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple who is John took her to his own house. So even Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, he made arrangements to care for his mom. And how much more for us who are still here on earth? Yeah? And why did Jesus do that? Perhaps during the time when 
uh, Jesus died on the cross, his earthly brothers, James and Jude, have not become believers yet. But later on, James became an elder of a church and Jude also wrote the book of Jude. And I believe that they took back their mother to stay with them. So, friends, this is the word of God because in 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 it says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So this is not Pastor Jeffrey's words. This is the Word of God. And forgive me if I've offended any one of you, yeah, but I think SIBKL, you are a wonderful church. You never neglect your parents. But this is the Word of God, and we have to preach the full counsel of God's Word. Amen? So who qualifies to be helped? And the Apostle Paul wrote this to Timothy, a true widow aged 60 and above, left alone and without human support, so they are eligible uh, even to be helped by the church. And for ladies, if you are an unmarried lady, you are still single uh, and you're wondering, how come no boy, no, no man interested in me, nobody chased me one? So, if you have these seven qualifications of an ideal woman, I tell you, there'll be a queue uh, uh, waiting at your door wanting you to be their girlfriend, yeah? So these are the seven qualities of an ideal woman. You are a one-man woman. You have a reputation for good works. You brought up children. You have shown hospitality. You have washed the feet of the saints. You're involved in supporting the church. You have cared for the afflicted and you are devoted to every good work. So these are the qualification of an ideal woman uh, and this is what the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy of those who qualified to be helped. So he also wrote advice to younger widows. So to younger widows, don't burden the church by remaining idle and busybodies. If a vow is made not to remarry but to dedicate one's life to serve God, don't break that vow. So this is not a vow of celibacy uh, and I will show you why later on. Then the third point, to remarry, especially very young ones and bear children, manage their household well, give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Just a couple of months back, I did two funerals where the guy passed on at a very tender age. So the first funeral I did was for a 30-over-year-old guy. Uh, he met with a hit-and-run accident and now the wife is a very young widow. And the second funeral that I did was that guy in his early 30s, he succumbed to uh, leukemia, uh, and he passed on, and the wife is also a young widow. But thankfully, there are family members who can come alongside them to support them. But if they don't have, the church is more than willing to come alongside them to help them. Amen? So, on point number two, if you have made a vow uh, as a young widow not to remarry, and you have dedicated your life to serve God, this reminds me of the prophetess Anna in Luke chapter 2, where the prophetess Anna, she was married for seven years, and after that, she became a widow, and she remained a widow serving in the temple until the age 84 years old. So, if you have made the vow, then keep the vow. But if you have not made any vows, then you can remarry, if the right one comes along. Amen? So anybody can be a busy body, eh? not just widows. Eh? Yeah? So how can somebody be a busy body? Anybody can be a busy body if they do not have God's interest in mind. So my friends, don't be a busy body. But if you want to be a busy body, be a busy body for God. Amen? Yeah? So have God's interest in mind. So in James chapter 1, 
verse 27, it says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And the application for us is, God wants us to care for our own families first and He wants us to help widows and orphans, foreigners and others who are in need. So in SIBKL, we have the blessed ministry and we help urban poor, we help widows, we help foreigners. Uh, and if you have been to our blessed uh, ministry weekend, you will know what we do in the church to help such people. Amen? So many years ago, when my mother-in-law was bedridden and she was in a nursing home, so there was this old uncle who has his mother also in the same nursing home and this is what he said to me and my wife. He said, looking at the mother lying down there, he said, hey, I'm saying or say, you know, meaning that if she don't die first, uh, I will be the one dying, uh, you know. And, and some people even go on to say, pak tau gen, song hak tau gen. That means a white-haired person attends the funeral of a black, head person. So essentially, when you say such things, you are actually cursing yourself. Yeah? So don't ever say this because God really wants us to take care of our own families and we are to take care of them. And all the more, if you are an anak sulung, which is the eldest in the family, yeah, you are to take care of your mother or your father. But then you say, but, but pastor, I didn't ask to be born first, ma. <laughs> then you tell God, Lord, don't tell me. Yeah? So that is uh, our responsibility yeah, as an anak sulung. Okay, moving on to the next part, honour and care for elders, pastors and leaders. In 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders who rule well literally administrate, be considered worthy of double honour, especially those who labour in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the labourer deserves its wages. So, the next slide, what does it mean to rule well? So, a pastor or an elder who is not a spiritual dictator nor a preeminent big shot. So this is what it means to rule well. How many of you, you have attended a church where the senior pastor or the pastor who preaches uh, is like a celebrity? Come on stage, preach, preach, preach. After that, leave the stage and you can't even shake his hand. How many of you, you have attended such a church before? God, la, there, I see hands. I've attended such church before. They really become like a preeminent big shot, you know, like a celebrity. Come on stage, preach, preach, preach. After that, well, God bless you. They leave the, the stage, and you can't even shake their hand. So to rule well, we are not to be a spiritual dictator nor a preeminent big shot. Yeah? So don't throw titles. Oh, I'm a pastor. No, you must listen to me. Or oh, I'm an elder. You must listen to me. No, 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 no. That is not how we rule well in the church. And in 1 Timothy 5, there are two kinds of elders and pastors. Number one, there is the ruling elders and pastors who takes care of the running of the church and the work of the congregation. Number two, on the teaching and preaching elders, pastors who taught the word of God. So the church needs both the ruling and the teaching and preaching pastors. So what is the key principle for compensation for elders and pastors? God has ordained a general principle of compensation. So he says the labourer deserves his wages and this even extends 
to beasts of burden. So do not muzzle an ox which is trading grain. So what this means is, if you have an ox which is trading grain, don't put a muzzle over his mouth because let the ox also eat the grain that has fallen on the ground. Uh, and this is exactly what the principle of compensation is. So it is unbiblical and not honouring to God and the church if you are not ploughing back to the church where you get spiritual nourishment. So I thank God that in SIBKL, we pastors, we are well taken care by all of you. And for that, I want to thank all of you Tarima Kase, you are a wonderful church. Give yourself a round of applause. Amen. Hallelujah. So we have been taken care of by so many of you and uh, it really warms my heart that truly you honour, you love our pastors. Yeah? Uh, and I was told that Pastor Chu has uh, an unending supply of durance to his house. Uh. So one day I may pop by and eat durance from his house. Yeah. So that is how you honour your pastors and truly uh, we want to thank all of you. You have been a great bunch. So what does double honour mean? Yeah? In dub double honour, 1 Timothy 5, 76 can be translated generous pay. So this is the Greek word which means honorarium uh, or generous pay. So the word honour is used to mean honorarium or compensation. So, the next slide says, unless the believers are fed, cleansed, and strengthened by the word, they will be weak and not strong. And in SIBKL, thank God that from this pulpit, the sermons that have been preached have built you all strong and stronger. Amen? How many of you, you really love to hear sermons being preached from this pulpit? Amen? Yeah, so many of you. And there are so many... Uh, even out there online, but it is different when you come together as a family and you draw God's Word and you come together to worship God. Amen? So it is God's job to keep the pastor humble and not greedy for money. It is the church job to obey the Word of God. So I know of some churches, uh, they say, Oh, we must keep our pastor humble. So they pay them the minimum wages and they squeeze the life out of the pastor. Uh, and the pastor is yak yok tech, you know, pao kaliao, do everything, you know, uh, on the light, off the light, uh, you know, lay out the chairs, you know, every week. And they really squeeze the life out of the pastor. So that is not very honoring. And it is not a good testimony even to the church. So let's honour and care for our pastors. So what is the application for us regarding compensation? It is God's plan that the needs of His servants be met by their local churches and He will bless churches that are faithful to His servants. If the church is not faithful and His pastors' needs are not met, it is a poor testimony and God has His way in dealing with that situation. So, in SIBKL, we thank God that we not only take good care of our pastors here, but we also pay the salary of some pastors in East Malaysia and in Semenanjung. So, you guys are fantastic. You are a generous church. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay, so the next we move on to uh, discipline for an elder or a pastor. In verse 19, it says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. So James chapter 3 verse 6 has this to say. Yeah, the next slide. Where there's smoke, 
there's fire could possibly mean that somebody's tongue has been set on fire of hell. Yeah, so this is uh, the Apostle James saying, so don't be a gossiper. Yeah? So some people, uh, they like to gossip a lot, you know, and they will go something like this. Hey, you know, uh, this Pastor Jeffrey, uh, wow, that day uh, he do this, do this, you know, so they will gossip. And from gossip, uh, actually the story is only very little story and it gets uh, compounded and magnified a hundred times until uh, you don't know what is the truth already. Yeah? So don't uh, lie on all these accusations unless you have two or three witnesses. So uh, the next slide, exercise caution when dis disciplining elders, pastors and leaders. And the purpose of discipline is always restoration. It is never to take revenge or to shame anybody. It must be substantiated with evidence of two or three witnesses. Do everything openly and above board. Act without prejudice against the accused uh, and do not be partial uh, for the accused. So the application for us is an accused elder, pastor or leader, if found guilty, must be rebuked and given the opportunity to repent. And if he does, he should be forgiven. And once he has been forgiven and restored, the matter is settled and should never be brought up again. I've been in SIBKL for 22 years. And in these 22 years, I can only remember two occasions where we have to discipline a pastor and the other case is we have to discipline a staff. So for the pastor, even when we discipline him, it is not in front of the congregation like this. It is done only in front of leaders and we have the elders, the council members and even then the disciplining was to restore him. We sent him for counselling and he was restored and we, he entered back into fellowship. Uh, and now this pastor is doing well. He's attending another church. And this is the whole premise of discipline that it is always to restore, never uh, to condemn or bring shame uh, to another party. Amen? So... The last bit, yeah, I'm bringing this to a close. Yeah, the last bit is honour appointment of elders, pastors and leaders. So in 1 Timothy 5.22, it says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. So why did uh, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Don't be hasty to appoint leaders. Why? So the next slide will give us the reason why. Because the sins of some people are conspicuous or obvious, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous or obvious, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. So the key principle for appointment of leaders is do not be hasty to appoint based on a person's charisma or capabilities. Yeah? So as human beings, we are attracted to charisma, we are attracted to capabilities. Wow, this guy can preach so well. Huh? Wow, this guy can sing so well. Huh? Wow, this guy can do this, can do that. So we are drawn and attracted to charisma and capabilities. And time and time again, it has been proven that when we appoint a person just based on charisma and capability, they don't last long. In SIBKL, we have a saying that we want to fly high and last long. Amen? So many of these people, they are appointed even to become pastors but they did not last long and they crashed and it is such an unfortunate thing to see. 
So do not be hasty to appoint leaders. So we are to appoint or ordain leaders, uh, not to uh, with sin in their lives. If we do that, we are actually partaking of their sins and the ministry of a local church rises and falls with its leadership. So the next slide, you will see that the church is the pillar and the foundation of truth. If we lose our credibility, why would people listen to us? So history has shown us that many church splits in the past is due to the credibility of their leader. So if we appoint somebody hastily and that person falls, the pillar and the foundation of the church will be shaken and if we lose our credibility, why would people listen to the church? So it really needs us to really apply this principle that when we appoint people, we really do not appoint them hastily. So can I have the worship team uh, up on stage? So the application here for us is the church needs spiritual wisdom and guidance in selecting and appointing its officers. Don't promote or ordinate people until they have proven themselves. So for us, here in SIBKL, the process of appointing a pastor goes through a very rigorous process. Even for me, uh, when I first came on board full-time as a pastor, I journeyed with Pastor Chiu for many, many years. So like I've mentioned earlier, I've been in SIBKL 22 years and I've been a full-time pastor five years. And the years leading to me being appointed as a pastor, uh, it was way back in 2017 when God really prompted me that I have made a vow to Him, but I have not fulfilled the vow. So I went up to see Pastor Chu, and Pastor Chu did not immediately say to me, Oh yes, Jeffrey, I've known you for 16 years already. I know your character. Yeah, come on board. No, he journeyed with me. And we did not say yes to one another until we pray together, we journey together. And it was not until a few months later where there was a pastor from US, from the International House of Prayer, Pastor Daniel Lim, who came and he gave a very peculiar altar call and he said that for those of you, you have made a vow to God and you have not fulfilled the vow, can you come to the front and I will pray for you. So when Pastor Daniel Lim gave that altar call, I look at Pastor Chu, Pastor Chu look at me and he said, this is it, you know. So he prayed for me and the rest is history. So now I'm here serving you as a full-time pastor. Amen. Yeah, so don't be hasty to appoint leaders. Journey with them and in the fullness of time, God will appoint them as leaders in the church. So in SIBKL, this is our structure of leadership. We have the elders. So we have Elder SK here. Uh, some uh, elders are away in Miri. So we have the council board as well. So the elders sets the spiritual direction of the church. They are the ones who can hire and fire pastors. So I, I need to take care of Elder SK because he can fire me as well. Yeah. So, so the elders are the ones who hire and fire pastors. The council are the ones who manage the resources of the church. They manage the finances. They manage the assets of the church. They manage uh, the hiring of staff as well. So in SIBKL, we have 18 full-time pastors and we have 11 lay pastors. So Pastor Twain here is a lay pastor uh, and Pastor John up there is also another lay pastor. So we have two lay pastors here today with us in the third service. So let us pray for our leaders. Let us stretch our hands and let's pray for the leadership of SIBKL. 
Father God, I thank you, Lord, even for the leadership of SIBKL. I thank you for the elders, for the council members. I pray, oh Lord, for a double portion of your wisdom to come upon the elders and the council members that whatever decisions that they make, oh Lord, I pray, oh Lord, that it will not just be their own decision, but truly it is a decision that comes from you and I pray that whatever decisions that they make, Lord, may it truly be ordained by you, may it truly be prompted by you, Lord. And I pray for our full-time pastors as well as our lay pastors as well and all the leaders in SIBKL that you will truly grow us from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from glory to glory, all for the glory of your name and yours alone. So we thank you, we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.